Thank you very much for this nice introduction and also for inviting me. It's, it's a great pleasure to finally uh, come here uh, to beautiful Sonoma County. So let me, I, I'm going to talk to you about the observation of the Higgs boson that we did uh, in 2012 at the Large Hadron Collider. This is a, a display of one of the events that uh, might uh, well come from a Higgs boson. What is key here is these four red tracks. Uh, the chance that this is actually a Higgs boson is about 50% because there's also background so it looks similar. But I'll explain all that uh, throughout the talk. So uh, I think most of you probably know what this, oh, this is, I know I'm gonna cut off here on the left. Um, so this uh, is a uh, aerial view of the area around Geneva. So this here is Lake Geneva, for instance. This here is Mont Blanc, the highest mountain in Europe. And here you see the Large Hadron Collider with a circumference of 17 miles. We have protons in this collider. We're accelerating a set of protons one way, another set of protons the other way and then we bring these into collisions at these yellow points, which is where we have our experiments to observe the collisions between these uh, protons. There's actually a, a, not just a few protons colliding at any moment in time, but it's, um, it's several hundred billion uh, protons going one way and going the other way. And these collisions occur uh, every 50 nanoseconds. So there's many collisions uh, occurring every second. Just to give you an idea of the scale, I've um, transformed LHC into the bay, so it is approximately the diameter of the Bay Bridge. This is actually the old Bay Bridge, but okay, the diameter is the same. Um, and the protons go really fast. They are going nearly at the speed of light, 99.999999% of the speed of light which mean, what, what it means is that we, the protons make a full turn around this ring 11,000 times per second. That would be great if we could do that with cars, wouldn't it? <laughs> okay, so then what is the LHC in general? The LHC on one hand is a microscope. So what we've learned in the last century is, is really how matter is composed. The ancient Greek thought that uh, the atom was the undividable it's, it's the most fundamental particle there is in nature. It, is, it cannot be split, which is what Adam means in Greece. And so this was uh, uh, around the birth of Jesus. So this has a scale of 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. But, and then for a, a long time, this was the belief until uh, in, in 1910, Ernest Rutherford found that the atom is actually composed of a nucleus and an electron cloud around it. And then uh, later it was found then, uh, 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 that, that the nucleus, again, is not a fundamental particle, but consists of protons and, and neutrons. So the proton is the one that we're colliding at the Hadron colli Large Hadron Collider. But even that is not fundamental, as we found out in the 1970s, actually, to an experiment um, at SLAC in the South Bay, uh, that, that this consists of quarks. And these are the, uh, this is, to our knowledge, at this moment, um, electrons and quarks are really the fundamental constituents of matter. Both of them, we just know that they are smaller than 10 to the minus 16 centimeter. We don't know uh, uh, how small they really are. This is the scale that we can probe with our current experiments. And with the LHC, we're, we're going uh, down by another factor of 10. We will see whether these quarks and electrons are actually still fundamental or they have some extended and, and, and are larger, 10 to the minus 17. So that's one thing that we can use the LHC to understand uh, through scattering processes um, how matter is composed. Another thing is that the LHC is sort of a time machine. So this shows here the history of the universe, uh, starting here from the Big Bang. And there was something that is uh, poorly understood, but it's called inflation that you might have heard about. There was actually very exciting uh, news quite recently on this. Um, and then the phase, and then after that, you have at the very beginning of the universe, you have a, a kind of a soup of fundamental particles of quarks, here Z bosons, W bosons, etc. And these all are interacting, and this is what we're trying, uh, this is, uh, these are particle physics interaction. And the LHC 
basically creates energies that are so high that we can see again these interactions. So for instance, one thing that uh, will come up later a little bit is one of the big puzzles in nature um, that is still out there where we haven't got a solution to is dark matter, which we know is there in significant amounts in the universe and that would have been there then also in the very beginning of the universe. And with the LHC, we're creating conditions again that let us, for instance, create dark matter, create Higgs bosons, create all kinds of particles. Okay, so now we see all the uh, quarks because the first generation here is, is the most important. That's why I was so disappointed of not uh, seeing it. So, so here, so these are the uh, quarks um, it, and these are uh, so-called leptons. And the first, and they come in three, uh, gen what we call generations. And the up quark, two up quarks and a down quark, they are inside a proton. And so all matter really is ultimately made out of up and down quarks and here the electron, uh, which, which we know from the atom. So, and then there are these extra generations and they decay very quickly into the first one, basically, so, so that they are not stable. And so that's why they do not play a role in our universe today. Um, uh, yeah. so, so, and then the other uh, parts of this, uh, our theoretical model are the force carriers. So the force carriers, they mediate the interaction between these matter particles. So there is the electromagnetic force, which is mediated by a photon. There is the strong force, so the strong force binds the protons and neutrons together in the nucleus, um, and this is mediated by a particle called gluon. And then there is the W and the Z boson, which are um, they're a bit more complicated. They actually, well, these ones do, uh, are, uh, have no mass. These have a, a significant mass, and these mediate the weak force. This is, for instance, very important for the uh, sun for the uh, uh, sun burning. And then last but not least, there is the Higgs boson. And this is, this is often known also as a keystone of the standard model. It, it gives mass to all of these other particles, but I'll explain that in a moment in more detail. So this is the, uh, what we call our standard model. And um, it's really developed since the, 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 the electron was discovered at the end of the 19th century and the Higgs boson was discovered in 2012, okay? So, so over 120 years or so, uh, we've developed this model. It works extremely well. It's a very, very precise uh, theory. It, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly the most precise theory that exists. What, uh, for instance, I'm just showing here some uh, comparisons. So what we do is we have draw these Feynman diagrams uh, after Richard Feynman, who was a professor at Caltech. Um, and so what we, we have interactions here. This is an electron and an anti-electron. They make a Z boson, and the Z boson decays into a quark and an anti-quark. This is how we read these diagrams, and, and I have a lot more later um, involving the Higgs boson. That's why I wanted to introduce them. So we can, based on, on this, we can calculate how often does this happen, okay? And this is what's shown here, really, what is uh, known as the cross-section. It's just really related to the rate of this process happening as a function of the energy of this E plus E minus pair, okay? And you see the in line is here the theoretical calculation, and these points are measurements, these green and blue and red points. So you can see this amazing agreement between the data points and... Uh, the theory at the at the percent level or better. Okay, so this is because we have this this really very precise theory which, with which we can predict this and verify. Also, we have very uh, precise measurements that ver verify the theory here. This is another example. This is um, at the Tevatron where I was working on before I was working on the LHC. This is a different process here. We have a quark and an anti-quark, a gluon, and again a quark and an anti-quark. And so here you see, again, the data confronted with the theory. You can see, again, very good agreement. Um, and this is here the showing the ratio of the two. The yellow indicates the uncertainty. So you see how, again, in this, uh, there is an excellent agreement. And here you see that the precision um, on the theory is of the order of 10 to 20%. OK, 
Okay, so, so, but then, so we've, over the past couple of decades at the colliders that I was just showing, the Tevatron and the LEP colliders, we have actually va validated, verified the standard model with very high precision. And what these precision measurements indicated to us is uh, that, that it is, there must be also, that it's very likely that there is also a Higgs boson, but this one we didn't observe yet. And Peter Higgs came up with is this mechanism, uh, this so-called Higgs mechanism to add an extra field in the universe, the Higgs field, in 1964. And at that moment, it was just one out of many uh, theoretical uh, possibilities. So, so this is the overall formula for this standard model, which I just showed you, which has different terms. This is about the forces here. Uh, so so I, I don't, well, you don't need to read or remember this in, in detail, but then there is this extra term for which we had no evidence. Um, but we knew it needed to exist because the problem was that the universe, as, it, as we had it without the Higgs boson, didn't make any sense. The problem is if there is no uh, Higgs field in the universe, then all particles have the same mass. And in fact, they have, they, they have no mass. So there's nothing in the universe that means the electron, the photon, and also the top quark it just whiz through and not, nothing happens to them. If you have a Higgs field in the universe, what, what it does, it interacts with these particles and slows them down, okay? So if a particle doesn't have a mass like the photon, then again, it's transparent to the Higgs field, or the, well, the Higgs field is transparent to it, so nothing happens. However, if this particle has a mass, it is equivalent to interacting with the Higgs field. So you can, and, and, and if it is very massive, it interacts a lot with the Higgs field. And so it, ca it basically is like, you can imagine it like a molasses that, that really slows the particles down significantly. And when slowing down means, you sh I, I, I don't know if you've um, had special relativity yet, but slowing down is nothing other than saying it has a mass. So the speed of light, particles that have no mass travel at the speed of light. And once they have a mass, they, they don't do that anymore. Um, and so this field, so this is the revolutionary thought that there is this Higgs field everywhere in the universe. It's present everywhere here around us. And by slowing particles down, or it, it gives them mass. And we knew that the particles in the standard model do have, uh, do have um, uh, mass. And so, so that's, that's why uh, we thought this must happen. So another... So, so David Miller, who's a professor at University College London, he was challenged to explain to the British government why they should spend money on finding the Higgs boson. And so, well, actually, he and many other English scientists, and this, he won the prize, though, for doing it best. So, so uh, you can imagine a cocktail party, and, you know, there's all these uh, guests, and they're all equally boring or equally interesting. They're just talking to each other and somehow evenly spread. Now a celebrity uh, arrives. This is, in this case, um, Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> um, but could be, it could be uh, someone else. So, and then, oh, then all the people get excited, and, and, and they cluster around her because they all want to talk to her. Okay, it depends. I mean, maybe some also go the other way, but uh, but it makes different. So so this so Maggie Thatcher cannot move as freely as all the ordinary guests. So she's in that sense much heavier than the ordinary guests. So that's how you could could maybe imagine this mechanism. Okay. Now one thing is, um, so my my colleague Mary Kay Gellara, but also these are uh, two other theorists here in the 70s at CERN, they at the moment, so, so this paper, the paper on the Higgs mechanism came out in 1964, <coughs> but it didn't, it didn't shake, uh, shake the world. It was just one out of many theoretical uh, um, explanations that um, may or may not be true in nature. It, it was only 10 years later that people started to really take it seriously and try to understand what experimental consequences this might have. And this is in this paper here where they, this is the conclusion, we should perhaps finish with an apology and a caution. We apologize to experimentalists for having no idea what is the mass of the Higgs boson. 
unlike the case with charm, blah, blah. And then they say, for these reasons, we do not want to encourage big experimental searches for the Higgs boson. <laughs> so this was the, the, uh, the thinking in, in the mid-70s. Then a lot happened. In particular, what really happened between the mid-70s and the mid-90s, when the funding for the LHC was secured, was that we developed a real trust and a, a very strong belief in the standard model through many, many precision measurements so that we really thought we have a very good theory that does describe all the data, but the Higgs boson is missing. We need to go out and look for that. So by the mid-90s, um, the Higgs boson was considered the most critical particle to be found experimentally, which is already now again also 20 years ago. Okay? And so at that time, it was then decided to build the Large Hadron Collider and the Atlas and CMS detectors. So before I go into it, because I'm going to need to use uh, units, which I wanted to uh, briefly introduce, so that we measure energy. What, what is, somebody tell me here, how is energy usually measured? That's right, exactly. So we don't measure it in joules, we measure it in electron volt, and one electron volt is 10 to the minus 19 joules. Um, and then uh, the uh, electron mass, for instance, is uh, 0 0.5 uh, mega electron volt uh, divided by C squared. The proton mass is approximately one giga electron volt. So the energy of the LHC we measure in, 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 in uh, giga electron volt is for, uh, of the beam is 4,000 giga electron volt. Um, the Z boson mass is, is 90. Uh, giga electron volt, top quark 172. This is the mass approximately the same as the mass of a gold atom and is the heaviest particle that we know. And I will also often use tera electron volts. So this is approximately corresponds to a thousand times the proton uh, mass. And then in general, what we do at this collider is we're converging energy into mass uh, according to E equals mc squared. So, um, we collide two protons, each has an energy of four tera electron volts, so that we have a total energy of eight tera electron volts. And so that means we can create a particle X with a mass of up to that uh, mass, up to that energy. So, so this is again one, how we draw these diagrams. So we have two protons. Now these do not actually, these are not the fundamental particles that uh, exist, but rather the fundamental ones are quarks inside those protons. These interact make a new particle call, I just call here X, but could be the Higgs boson, um, and then that particle is short-lived and will decay back into ordinary particles, for instance, to electrons here. And this is what we observe in our detectors. And we measure then everything about this. This The only thing we really measure is, is this, and we measure everything about this. We measure the energies and the angles of those, and then are able to deduce what X, what could have happened really here, what, what X is. So this, it's, it's somehow, can I? Uh, it, it, yeah. You did have the screw getter, so I'm so That would be great, out. okay. Um, okay, so this is uh, here, pictures now from the LHC accelerators. So these are, we have um, now in this 17 mile circumference, there, is, there are uh, two b uh, major components. One set of um, so-called RF cavities accelerates those protons, so that, that increases their energy every time they, travel, uh, they go through that. And the other set of components are magnets that steer the protons on the path. They need to stay on the circle. And uh, this, is our, this shows here uh, the, uh, a cross-section of one of these um, magnets, these dipole magnets that keep the uh, protons on their path. These are the field lines. So you have one set of protons going uh, inside the bore, into the bore, and the other going outside. And then, uh, yeah. And so th and these, they are encased in these blue things here. So this is the last dipole actually being lowered into the LHC in 2007. They are all superconducting and cooled to 1.9 uh, Kelvin. And they're running at a very high field of up to 8 Tesla. So then I have a movie now. Ah, media not found. Oh. Ah. 
Okay. I don't know. It has always worked. Okay. Never mind. So, well, okay. So what happens is that we inject inject the protons in a, in, in, in a couple of smaller rings in the LHC. It's too bad. That maybe I can play it at the end. Um, and, and then we bring them on co to collisions at the LHC in these different interaction points that I already showed in the beginning. These are the um, detectors that we then use so, so the, uh, to detect them. So protons are coming here from the right, protons coming from the left, and then they're colliding here in the middle of, of the detector and we try to encase it completely with this instrumentation to figure everything out what happens in these collisions. These are, these are quite massive, so, so they, they weigh several uh, kilotons, these detectors. Atlas is, is 140 foot long, uh, and I'll show you pictures in a moment, and 80, fo uh, uh, 80 foot tall. So it's like a four or five story building. Uh, they are very heavy, so this shows here an example. This, uh, this CMS detector, for instance, uh, uses lead for uh, its, one of its components, the carometer, and it's actually 30% heavier than the Eiffel Tower. So why do we do this? So what we want to do is we want to identify all the particles that are produced um, <coughs> in these collisions. So this shows uh, a sketch here. So the collision occurs here in the very center, and then we encase it with different um, technologies that have different roles and could, can do different things. So for instance, this cyan color here in the begin middle is a tracking chamber. So what it, its role is to find all charged particles. So only if the particle has any electric charge, it's supposed to measure <coughs> it and we make a trajectory in this tracking chamber. It is actually um, mostly built out of silicon um, detectors. And then, so when we see a particle have a trajectory, we already know it's charged. In fact, we embed it into a magnetic field, and then due to the Lorentz force, a, a particle then gets deviated within, the, uh, within a magnetic field, depending on its uh, speed, its velocity, and depending on its charge. So, so this particle curves one way, this one curves the other way. The degree by which it curves tells us about the momentum of the particle and the direction in which it curves tells us whether it's uh, negatively or positively charged. Then we encase this by a carometer. That's this red thing here, which is an electromagnetic carometer. Its, uh, its role is to completely stop anything that has, is a photon or an electron. And to, so these stop completely and uh, we can measure the, uh, uh, measure the entire energy of it and of course its location. Then we have another carometer, a, a, a hadronic carometer, which detects protons and neutrons. And then we have also the blue thing, which is a, a, again a tracking detector ultimately, but it detects the only particles that do not get stopped uh, by these carometers and leave a trace in this blue chamber or so-called muons, so that's the um, heavy that's the second generation lepton. It's slightly heavier than the electron. So then we know that whenever we see a signal in the blue detector, we know that this must have been a muon. Okay. So so it's it's uh, so the electron, for instance, we see something here and a track, then we know it's an electron. If we see only something here and no track, we know it's a photon, etc. So it's it's a bit like a puzzle that we make use of all these different complementary pieces of information to really understand which particles were made. So this is the big job of what a physicist does. And a particle physicist does, the main thing is to build detectors. These are not, these we cannot buy. They're custom made um, uh, for, for this purpose. So this is, for instance, here, these are tracking detectors. So, so these are modules of silicon. Uh, and, and whenever a charged particle tra travels through the t silicon, it ionizes it and the, uh, uh, well, the electrons or the whole pairs, they drift um, to, to, to the sides where we have then a voltage we have applied and then we uh, observe a signal and then we know that a, a particle has hit it. So for instance, we actually, so we have many concentric barrels for instance and then if a charged particle uh, uh, traverses it so this is, for instance, a low-momentum one. This is a high-momentum one. Then we observe these hits, 
on these different silicon modules. And then we have software, a lot of uh, software that then recognizes these tracks and uh, realizes that this is one trajectory from one particle. These, uh, the, the, the precision to which we measure, uh, measure uh, uh, want to measure these tracks is approximately 10 microns, so that's a hundredth of a millimeter. Oops, wrong direction. And here are some pictures of the carometers. So this is here, um, so in Atlas, this Alcorion shaped calorimeter. So an electron or photon comes in from here, and then we get an electromagnetic shower. So this is a, a copper. Um, I know actually this is lead here together with um, an argon which and then so so when light is produced we the, the light output of this carometer is proportionate to the total energy of this uh, electron when it goes in uh, does this work yeah so this is just showing here from the construction so this hall, how it was filled, the Atlas Cavern, you see here, these are the big magnet structures here in the cavern being put together. Uh, you see here a person. Oh, here you see the person. So this was when the, the big magnet structure for the Mion system was completed. So it's, the engineering um, is, 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 in my opinion, also very impressive. Uh, this is the uh, rival experiment, the CMS experiment. So, so both Atlas and CMS, they in, in general have the same concept that they have these tracking chambers, these carometers, so this is all the same, but in detail they use different technology in every single case. Conceptually they're similar, but they, they, they use different technologies. We have a lot of people, of course, um, working on the detector. So, th this, so here, this is, for instance, uh, me here with the Berkeley Pixel Group. So the students and also, this is when before, so the pixel detector, which is this most inner tracking detector, which uh, I worked on directly. Uh, this is mostly what I've been working on, this one, which is the first detector that any particle sees when it gets produced at the LHC. Oops. The, so, so this is how we were working on it in 2007 before installing it. Uh, down in the pit. This is here one of our, these are the, our two important engineers. They are the most important. But there's also many of the students and postdocs here who, who are uh, working on this detector then. Now the thing is with this detector, when we, you have to get it ready, it's, it's, you can't, we can't access it anymore once it's there in the beam. So it's, it's not too similar, to, too dissimilar from sending it off into space, yeah? So we were able to now access it in 2013 the next time it was to th so so it needs to be really 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 well tested that it doesn't fall apart because we don't we we, we cannot easily fix it and then we have many visitors uh, coming also now in the shutdown so for instance this shows here this is peter hicks who who came up with this higgs mechanism with, with the former spokesperson who founded the atlas experiment peter yenny then i recently had the pleasure to uh, show atlas to will i am from the black eyed peas in uh, 2013. He's very excited about uh, STEM research in general, actually. I also had the pleasure of showing it to Stephen Hawking in 2013. And for instance, but then we also have politicians coming. So Steve Chu, who was at the time the director of the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, came in 2007. And so here you see everyone, we're always posing in front of this, what we call the big wheel, the big neon wheel for detecting neon. The Atlas collaboration is, 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 is a very global endeavor, uh, enterprise. So, so this shows uh, here all the countries that are involved. There's 38 countries from and 176 institutions and 3,000 scientists working on it. A thousand of these scientists are students, actually. So a large fraction of the w work gets actually done by students. And you <coughs> see that it's mostly really young people in the collaboration. This shows the age profile for male and female physicists on Atlas. And so you see that 40% uh, uh, and for women even 60% are, are less than 35 years old. So half, half of the people are really uh, quite young. Okay. Now, so then now let's go and 
get to the fact that we were actually taking data. So this this whole uh, thing started in 2009 when on November 23rd of 2009 we saw the first proton-proton collisions at the LHC. We did not see them yet at the high energy which allowed us to see the Higgs boson that they were at low energy. But you can see after this all this time many people had started to work on it in the mid 90s. Um, so, so for more than a decade they were anticipating this moment so you can see this huge excitement um, that was there then. I, I'm not sure whether the excitement was bigger at that time or later when we found the Higgs boson. Then we t started to take data uh, in 2010 at high energy. So what we, uh, what we look at, what we quantify, what we want is what we call luminosity. So luminosity is just really the total number of proton-proton interactions that we get to collide in our detector. So uh, and this is here shown as a function of months and a year. So you see in 2010 is this green, so very little. Then in 2011, the red, and then we got this uh, fantastic uh, 2012, where we got more than t 10 to the 15 proton-proton interactions. The reason that we want so many is that the rate that is very rare that two protons interact to produce a Higgs boson. So, so we need to get really a lot of them. So out of these 10 to the 15, there's only uh, so one. Uh, uh, so so th there's only about the thousand which have a Higgs boson. Um, we have every second we get about one billion of these interactions and we're not and each of them has a size of one megabyte so that's gigantic data volumes which we can't actually handle what we do is we decide very quickly whether this event is worth keeping or is is boring if it's boring then we reject it so we only keep about 400 out of these one billion interactions to, because they are interesting. The other ones, they are not interesting enough to keep. And the reason is that we have big computing challenges. So, so we actually do have a worldwide, so-called worldwide LHC computing grid, WLCG. And as I said, so we have data volumes. We were writing about 600 megabytes per second. We are writing 5,000 terabytes every year. Uh, just, to, uh, just to reconstruct a single event out of all the hits the detector measures takes approximately 15 seconds and we have 400 events per second. So, so it's, it's, it's very large uh, computing challenge. What we do is we store all these data worldwide. So we have the uh, so-called tier zero at CERN and then we have many centers t called tier one centers. One is in the U.S. at Brookhaven on Long Island, for instance. Then there's one in the U.K., in Germany, etc. So we distribute it over the entire, uh, over, the, over the world and have many of these centers in different places. Okay, so then, so how do we now finally detect uh, the Higgs boson? So what we actually see is, this is similar to the picture I showed at the very beginning. This is after we have recorded an event and run our custom software over it to try to make sense of it. This is how an event looks like. So this here, for instance, this pink big thing, this is a photon in the parameter. You have to trust me on that. I, I know it's not completely intuitive, presumably, because this scale is, shows that, that the, the fact that it's a big peak, it's, it means that it has high energy. So, but what we don't, what in, in order to uh, know, I mean, so, so this is what we observe and we want to connect it to what has actually ultimately happened, right? So, so oops. Um, so, so this is, uh, yeah, so from our reconstructed events, we need to uh, connect it to this. So what we do is we measure these angles and energies very precisely and then we can form what we call the invariant mass of this, so we, when we have these two two photons, we can uh, form the invariant mass, and then we realize that it's a Higgs boson. I, I will show you in a moment. So one, uh, we did this many times in the past. So this shows for two muons instead of two photons. So the Higgs, as I will show you, the Higgs discovery was done in the case where there is, are two photons in the event, but another very good calibration signal we usually use is, is two muons in the event. And you see what, what, what is typical in particle physics is that we see some sort of spectrum which is uh, I mean, roughly falling 
And then we have all these peaks. And all these peaks are exactly due to the fact that there is a new particle. So this, this particle here is this Z boson, which was discovered in 1984. This was the Upsilon, which was discovered in 1976, I think, uh, et cetera. So this is generally new particles appear as uh, peaks in such a spectrum because this mass that we reconstruct, we can calculate from all these angles. Okay. Um, so this is uh, here the production and the decay of the Higgs boson. So we have here two gluons from the proton. The proton contains also gluons producing a Higgs boson and this Higgs boson now decays into two photons. This happens only 0.2% of the time when we produce a Higgs boson. But, as you will, but this is the best way of finding it. The other 99.8% is, is, is actually much harder to observe. Um, and then another option is that what the Higgs can also do is that it decays to two Z bosons, and these both decay to muons or electrons. And so that's the two that I will uh, focus on. So this is showing here, uh, again, uh, this diagram. Now, what, is the, what the problem is, is that the only thing that we detect here is these two photons, but there is many other ways that two photons can be produced. And so this is another such diagram, but this, is, uh, this doesn't involve any Higgs boson, right? But it still has these two uh, photons. So this is a background, and from when I just see two photons in the event, I can never know, is it, this, is it due to <coughs> this or is it due to that? What I do is I form this mass quantity which is related to the two energies, is to the product of the two energies, and the opening angle between the two uh, photons. And this is, the, uh, this is then, if it proceeds via a Higgs production, this is equivalent to the Higgs mass. So what we see there, what, and why this one just has a random value. It is always preferred um, to be lower rather than higher, so this is a, it gives us a falling spectrum. That's here, this yellow. Okay, so that's just background. While the Higgs, it would always give us a, a peak in this quantity. And so that's what we're looking for. We're looking on, uh, for this narrow peak on, on this background. This is now showing the data how we collected them, started to collect them in uh, 2011 as they are coming in. So the scale here is increasing, as you see, with more and more data. And uh, this is, yeah, right. So that's <laughs> this is now the, the full data set as we had it at that time. And so you see there is this, this is this peak, okay, that we're looking for. Now, you can say, well, maybe it's not so impressive. It's not as good as some of the other peaks I showed you. What, of course, gives us, oops, it's doing it again. Uh, what gives us confidence, this is the same here, is that not only did we see this in one experiment, but we saw it in the other experiment as well, and we saw them both at the same point, uh, place, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's in both cases, at, at this is then, and the place where it occurs is, is the mass of the Higgs boson. Now this is how such an event looks like. So these are these two photons here. Then there is a lot of random tracks that have nothing to do with the two photons. Um, but as I said, the, 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 the most likely, I mean, I can't tell you that this, is, this has a chance of less than 1% to actually be a Higgs boson because you see, this peak here is on this big background, so there's about 2,000 background events and only like 200 Higgs events, okay? So, well, the, so the chance that this is actually a Higgs boson is about one to 10. We have uh, another way of looking for it is the Higgs to ZZ, which I showed you before. Here we have a much better signature background of approximately one to one, so I let it build up here also. Again, the data is the black points and now we have here a background model. The main background is this red one, which is ZZ production. And what you see here is, in here you see some data points which do not agree with the background model. Here, now it's zoomed in. And so this is here. This is the Higgs uh, boson here. So here you see that uh, actually in this event, so there is approximately as much signal as there is background. Okay, so then, uh, so then what we can quantify in order to, to, to announce a discovery, what we need to convince ourselves is that 
the um, that it really is due to a new particle and it is not a statistical fluke. So what can happen uh, in principle is that you just get a, so for instance this one here. So you just somehow randomly due to statistics you get uh, get something that uh, is a bit higher than the background expectation. Yeah. So what we quantify this and uh, say what is the probability that background alone would give us a signal as big or bigger than what we see in the data. And that's what we uh, show here as a function of, of the mass. And so in this case, it's at 125, it's seven sigma. So the probability is less than 10 to the minus 11. So, so it's less than one in, 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 in a, a hundred billion. So, so that's why we said this is really an observation of a new particle and not just a statistical <coughs> uh, fluke. And so this is to, just to conclude. Um, so this is here Fabiola Gianotti, who was the Atlas spokesperson at the time. This was on July uh, 4th, 2012, after she gave the talk for uh, my experiment, Atlas, to announce this discovery, and Peter Higgs was was in the audience. Uh, it's been a very long journey. I mean, so it's 1964 is when uh, this Higgs boson was first thought of and, uh, and uh, was explaining how fundamental particles can acquire mass. The collaborations Atlas and CMS were formed nearly 30 years later in 1992. And then 20 years after that, this particle was actually observed. So it's been a very long wait for Peter Higgs, but he fortunately he he uh, lived through this and then was awarded the Nobel Prize together with Francois Anglia last year. So what is happening now? Uh, so 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 this is was one of the big puzzles was really do we have a Higgs boson and is it responsible for generating mass in the universe? But there's many other puzzles in the standard model even though I told you that it is a very precise theory and can predict a lot of things, it has its flaws. So for instance, one of the biggest uh, uh, problems of the standard model is that it doesn't have any dark matter. The universe, we actually have uh, four or five times more dark matter. 23% of the universe is made out of dark matter while only 4% is made out of visible <coughs> matter. So. So I guess it's more than five times more dark matter than, than visible matter. And we don't know which fundamental particle this is supposed to be associated to. Uh, so this is, there are searches ongoing at the LHC and also in underground experiments to search for uh, dark matter. In particular, the LHC is now in the middle of a two year break to do uh, repairs to actually further increase the energy. So. The energy we had was eight tera electron volts and we're going to increase it to 13 or 14 tera electron volt. And as I told you in the beginning, the higher the energy is, the higher the mass of the particles that we are able to produce. So for instance, it might well be that the dark matter particle was just too heavy that we haven't seen it for that reason yet. And uh, when we now nearly doubling the energy, we have a, bit, a better chance of discovering uh, new particles because we can access heavier states. And then also what we are also doing is we're further studying the Higgs boson to understand whether it's really fully consistent with the standard model. So for instance, this model tells us precisely how often it decays into photons and Z bosons, etc. And, and so we want to measure this uh, very precisely to see whether, uh, whether this agrees. And that's all I have. Thank you. This is very good. We have um, 10 minutes remaining for questions, and then uh, at that point, uh, we usually um, release uh, any of the students that need to get to other classes. Um, so um, I'll just say this right now. Uh, if you're staying till 5 for the questions, then, then uh, we'll have a short break, and um, I will sign for anyone who has, needs extra credit. Okay, but let's um, start with um, questions for Dr. Heinemann. Yeah. Do you think the movie might show outside of the PowerPoint presentation? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. The question was, would the movie show outside of the PowerPoint, which is a good suggestion for us um, possibly seeing this. 
Oh, I don't know. Uh, it should. I mean, I'm, I'm actually surprised <laughs> that it doesn't work. Actually, let me try to see because this is a talk I gave some other time. Let's see whether where it definitely worked. Okay, so I can take another question in the meantime while I'm trying to fix this. What did you think of the movie Particle Pizza? I thought it was great, actually. So I actually talked a lot to the director while he was making it. Mark Levinson was the director. And I know many of the characters uh, there. Uh, somehow I was cut out of it, but that's okay. <laughs> no, I thought it's a very good... So, so for me, it was really, I mean... Like living through this again, there was there was a lot of drama, right? So so in the beginning in 2008, there was we had a big it, it was depressing because the machine didn't actually work. We had to wait a year, then finally to come on, and then it was a slow start, and we needed to really understand our detector. It was very very hard and 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 fast that we had to understand things, and then to actually see the expose on. I think he captures really well how scientists work and think, so I, I, I thought it was fantastic. I mean, in the, the email that I sent him afterwards, I, it said, I love, love, loved it. <laughs> so I really enjoyed it a lot. How did you like it? I, I thought it was terrific. Okay. It built to the end of excitement of the yes. discovery and then the right. Nobel Prize. Just to restate it to people in here, this is a movie called Particle Fever. It's showing in the Rialto in uh, Sebastopol. Rialto Sebastopol sounds fantastic. <laughs> I don't. Um, my my question would be, um, what, what about the you know the, the the magnet setbacks and so on? Yes. And you talked about the time scale of you know being involved in a um, in an effort that that takes you know time measured in decades. Yes. Right. Um, I mean, what's your personal experience of in investing in big science, let's say, science that does take decades to complete? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, Is it, I mean, scary, I mean, one thing, right? I mean, right. investing your career and then, you know, you, if you don't have the results, that, that's a lot of time and to, right. to, to beat down on parameter space rather than make right. a detection. Right, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I don't know how to... I mean, one of the big, the big, I mean, what is really quite impressive, in my opinion, is actually that it's even possible. It's even possible that we have 40 funding agencies who need to get together and each give their piece of money to it. We have 3,000 scientists that have to come together. And of course, there's big decisions that need to be made all the time on technologies, for instance, or things. So, so that it's even, I mean, from a sociological point of view and from a financial point of view, that it's even possible to get together is, is, is quite amazing. And, and the p people who had the vision, of course, I'm, I'm young in the sense that I only started to work on it in 2007. Many of my colleagues started in the mid-90s already. And, and to really see it through for these 15, 20 years until we see for this. I mean, of course, the thing is that you don't know in the beginning how long. When it was started, the hope was that it would be online in 2000. <laughs> That's how you string people along, right? <laughs> so, so, but I think, I think it's probably true that if you knew, one has, to, one has to really be for this, one has to be an optimist. One has to be an optimist and think that yeah, okay, we're going to make it on that time scale and we're, it's going to work and we're going to get the money and so on. If you don't, if you're not that, you can't have that. You can't sustain it, I think. So, so. And you have to, from generations, pass on knowledge from generation to the, yes. Yeah, did you talk about a doubling the energy in 2015? <coughs> yes. How much higher can we really go? That's it then. I mean, so the high maximum we can do is 14 TeV. Okay, there's some thoughts of maybe going a little higher, but, but it's, it's limited by how much current the magnets are designed to hold. So, so, so now, because of the accident in 2008, there's some flaw in the connectors between the magnets, which is why we weren't able to go to the full energy now, but this is basically being fixed now and then we shouldn't go to the full energy but we can't go beyond the design so this is the, this is it then yes in the back so um, it's my understanding that uh, if they found the, the Higgs boson <coughs> at, they, they were looking at two things 115 um, MeV or 140 MeV Cheap. and this turned out One theory and 
Well, okay, so, so the story is indeed, so, so what the mass of the Higgs boson means is, is indeed unclear. I mean, it's a free parameter in the standard model. It could be anything, okay? Could have any value. So we already knew from previous colliders that it, it, it was going to be heavier than 114. And there is a theory called supersymmetry that wants it to be as low as possible. So that's why the theory says, okay, it should be 115 because it can't be lower than that because it's been excluded to be lower than that. So in the standard model, it's a completely free parameter, so it could really have any value between 115 and 1,000. Okay, so um, the fact that it is relatively low, which is close to 115, lets people speculate that maybe this is a sign that supersymmetry might be the right theory, but it would have liked it a little lower. Now one can tweak it, and then one can get the mass a little higher again. Now, 140 would have really ruled out supersymmetry, for instance. So, so or it, it would have super stretched it. I think that a lot of people would have, at that moment, given up on supersymmetry. Supersymmetry, maybe just to say, is, is, is really the, the mainstream theory for what would, would be a more complete version of the standard model. So rather than having, um, rather than having uh, these particles, so, so we have a whole new copy of these particles, uh, um, is, is, which, uh, so for, for every, every matter particle, we have another copy, so these, which have a different, uh, different spin is the technical term, it's a symmetry. So just like there is matter and antimatter, that's a charge symmetry, we would have superpartners, normal particles and superparticles. So it's, it's a different symmetry, similar to matter, antimatter. It's, um, and that the, the, the thing is that it solves several problems. For instance, it has a natural candidate for dark matter in the universe. And it also, one of the other big puzzles, the big puzzle really is why is the Higgs mass so low? If in the standard model it could just have any value, why is it so low? Um, it, there is the so-called fine-tuning problem and supersymmetry solves that too. So. But really, it's not yet known whether the mass, I mean, what the mass is telling us, it's not yet known. John, did you have a question? No, it's uh, about future physics, really. There presumably were other checks on the standard model so far. Does the standard model look good? Do you suspect something new? No, in general, it looks good. I mean, we've published by now 280 papers. And approximately half of them actually look for something new and reported that they haven't found it. So that we say, so, so half of the papers, so maybe 140, 150 papers, we've actually searched for new particles and have not found it. There's only one new particle we have found. The other half of the papers, 140 or so, uh, uh, are making precise measurements of processes where we think we know or, uh, what's happening, but again, if this, there could be new contributions coming in, and then we would see a deviation of our data from the theoretical prediction. So neither has happened yet. Um, uh, so, so we hope now. I mean, so there are, there is, for instance, this big problem of dark matter, which could be because of supersymmetric particles being produced. So we hope with the higher energy, we are able. To, so these are, must be heavy. So these supersymmetric particles, we already know that they must be heavier than, than, than much heavier than the Higgs boson, for instance. Like a factor 10 times heavier than the Higgs boson. Otherwise, we would have seen them. So now with the higher energy, we're able to push the boundary further there. So, so we can access them if they're about 10 times heavier than the Higgs boson, up to 20 times heavier or something. So. Very good. Let me follow that. It's hard to put into words. I want to put my money on something. There's a, I think, 100 GeV collider sort of being comprehended. Yes, that's and right. Not on the other hand, but should we put more into astrophysics experiments where we have this, this right. uh, impasse on that? Well, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, ultimately, to really understand what's happening, 
the collider is 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 more precise, yeah, because it's uh, produced in the laboratory and and, and astrophysical. There's uh, there's more room for interpretation usually, but of course at the moment the evidence on the dark matter comes from astrophysical data indeed. So so I think it's complementary. I think one should put money into both. But um. <laughs> yes. I'd like us to um, th thank Dr. Heinemann again, and we can stay for another 10 minutes for an extra session of questions. Thank you.